welcome to the Mars Discovery District. We're really uh, happy that you all came out tonight and we're really excited about tonight's talk. My name is Charles Finley. I'm a VP of Communications and Marketing here at Mars and I'm co-host of this evening's event. Uh, I'd like to thank our, our co-hosts Tim Drayman and Geraldine Cahill for inviting me to make these opening remarks before we start. Over the course of the last four years, Mars has partnered with the Social Innovation Generation to bring many inspirational people into this space. Just last month, we heard from Yuri van den Stedenhoven, director of the Mars Solutions Lab, who gave a, gave a great talk and who's working to accelerate our path to solutions for some of Ontario's deepest social challenges. Mars knows that entrepreneurs and innovators are key drivers for Canada to lead in the midst of transformative changes that are posed to us by globalization, technology, and new ways of working and learning. Just such a change is one our guest, April Rennie, will address this evening, and that is the collaborative economy, also known as the sharing economy. On December 18th, 2013, entrepreneur Peter Schwartz wrote in the Globe and Mail that as we head into 2014, one trend will tower above them all. The movement of business and consumer activity towards the collaborative economy. This shift in market behavior will present tremendous opportunities for entrepreneurs who are paying attention. The collaborative economy focuses on eliminating excess and waste in today's overbuilt and overowned world. That's a quote from Peter. Tonight, we will talk about this trend specifically in its application to cities. If you've ever used Airbnb, AutoShare, or Zipcar, you'll have some knowledge of the collaborative economy and what a disruptive innovation it is becoming for urban systems. In addition to my work at Mars, I'm also part of a nonprofit group called Urban Digital Toronto, the work of which is to bring urbanists and technologists together to spark a new dialogue around emergent trends, such as the collaborative economy also known as the sharing economy, as I mentioned. Just last August, Urban Digital organized an event here at Mars called New Modes of Urban Mobility, which looked at the sharing economy's impact on transit, planning, and on how people move around the city. Our hope was that these perspectives enter into the urgent dialogue that Torontonians are having on transit. Sorry. Tonight, we'll look at the larger urban canvas and we're introducing Toronto and indeed Canada to the latest thinking around the dramatic growth of collaborative consumption and the sharing economy. The evening has two parts. Our speaker, April Rinney, will begin, and then we'll have a moderated question and answer session. So before welcoming April, uh, I'd like to uh, just introduce quickly our moderator who will be here tonight, um, Edward Keenan, serves as senior editor and lead columnist at the Grid Magazine in Toronto. Edward is one of the most insightful and thoughtful Toronto journalists, asking probing questions about how we can create a better city. An eight-time finalist at the National Magazine Awards, he's a contributing editor at Spacing Magazine, and his column on politics and city life appears every Saturday in the Toronto Star. Edward is also the author of Some Great Idea, Good Neighbourhoods, Crazy Politics, and the Invention of Toronto. So on to our speaker. April Rinney is the Chief Strategy Officer of the Collaborative Lab. She's been involved with collaborative platforms and services for several years. She has more, of a decade of, uh, more than a decade of experience focusing on disruptive businesses innovation, financial inclusion, law, policy, micro-entrepreneurship, social enterprises, and management of common resources. So really hardly involved with anything at all. Right? <laughs> Uh, at Collaborative Lab, April works with companies, governments, and entrepreneurs worldwide who are interested in understanding collaborative consumption and harnessing its potential to create a more sustainable future. Previously, April was a director of Water Credit at water.org, and she's worked as a private lawyer focusing on international finance, has taught for the International Development Law Organization, and, and has advised numerous social enterprises. April holds a JD from Harvard Law School, an MA from international, in International Finance and Business Relations from the Fletcher School, and a BA in International Studies and Italian from Emory University. I expect you to show off a little bit of that Italian tonight. April's visit to Canada is part of the launch of Cities for People, a Canada-wide initiative to create more resilient and livable cities. 
Cities for People is an initiative of the J.W. McConnell Family Foundation, and its partners include the Social Innovation Generation, One Earth, Evergreen City Works, Montreal Urban Ecology Centre, and Musa Getes. In Toronto, April's visit is co-hosted with Evergreen City Works, and she has just come from a, a really successful event in Montreal last night. She spent the day with us here at Mars uh, and with SIG uh, on workshops and sessions, uh, and she's move, go, moving on to Calgary and Vancouver as part of a national tour. All coming this week, all happening this week. 14 events, she said, she's doing in one week, which is a lot. Um, April is uh, an expert in turning the lens around on things and looking at things in a different way. And she mentions that she does this in a physical way as well by turning handstands wherever she is. So I'm expecting to see <laughs> some handstands later tonight. I very much look forward to hearing from April this evening and invite you to join me in welcoming her up to the stage. Good evening. I'm really happy to be here. This is an exciting week. As Charles mentioned, this is the second stop on our Collaborative Economy Canada Roadshow. Over the course of this week, we're visiting four cities to talk about the collaborative economy with a range of audiences. We're catalyzing, connecting ideas catalyzing ideas, connecting dots, and building networks here in Toronto and across the country. These efforts are part of the Cities for People initiative, which you've just heard about as well. Our hope is to help make Canadian cities more shareable cities, and what it would mean for Canada to become a global leader in this space. Tonight, I'm going to show you how the collaborative economy has the potential to transform communities, build a more sustainable future, and improve social outcomes. I'm going to do this by showing you how these new collaborative models and platforms have the ability to reimagine marketplaces, lifestyles, and communities. We're going to look at examples and stories from around the world of how this is happening in many different ways and how Canada fits in. On the business side, we'll, mean, we'll see what this means for market disruption as well as new business opportunities. For cities, we'll see what this means to boost resilience and the key role that local government plays. Now, I've only been able to pick a few examples of these models of, out of literally thousands that I could have. Some of these models will be familiar to you. That's intentional. I want to show you how what used to be niche is now mainstream, and I suspect that I will share with you many more things that hopefully you've never heard of before. My goal is to show you how broad and diverse the collaborative economy is, how easy it is to get involved and benefit from it, and how what's happening here in Toronto and across Canada is part of a much larger global phenomenon. So before we get started, let's do a little bit of history so that you can understand how we ended up here today. Now, there's nothing new about sharing. It's one of the oldest behaviors known to mankind. But what is new is the advent of technologies that enable us to connect people and things to share in new ways. For contemporary purposes, for tonight's purposes as well, let's trace this back to the founding of the internet. So join me on a journey back 19 years to 1995 when a young entrepreneur named Piero Midiar conducted a little social experiment in his quest to create the perfect marketplace. Over the course of a weekend, Pierre built a simple website on which people could buy and sell things. The first thing he posted on this website was this broken laser pointer for $14.83. You can imagine his surprise when shortly after posting this, he received a bid for $14.83. And he emailed the guy and said, you realize this laser pointer is broken? And the potential purchaser responded and said yes you realize I'm a collector of broken laser pointers. <laughs> now, some of you may know Pierre Omidyar is the founder of eBay. This website went on to become eBay. 130 million people bought and sold items on eBay last year, 
At any given point in time, there are half a billion items for sale, many of which are secondary goods, which factors in to sustainability. Now, what Pierre tapped into was the ability of these technologies to connect needs and haves more efficiently and to create marketplaces and inventory that could scale. Now, around about the same time in Montreal, entrepreneurs there also started thinking about how can we match needs and haves more efficiently. They went on to found Comunauto, which is the first large-scale car sharing platform in all of North America. What I want to call out here is how incredibly early this was and how early Canada was already ahead of the curve. Fast forward five years, and a woman named Robin Chase followed in Comunauto's path. And she started wondering, what would happen if we could tap into a fleet of shared vehicles instead of needing to own our own? She had looked into what we call the cost usage equation of cars and found that it's pretty bad. On average, cars sit idle 23 hours a day and cost more than $700 a month to maintain. This is a tremendous waste of resources. And when you think about it, why is it that we have actually allowed this behavior to become normal, whereas in fact, it's tremendously wasteful? So Robin went on to found the company Zipcar, which you may now know is a multinational corporation. It exists throughout North America and in Europe. Zipcar has nearly a million members today, but it's estimated that by 2020 there will be more than 30 million members of car sharing networks like it. What Robin really recognized, building on Pierre's insights around matching needs and haves, is that we're beginning to see a shift where people are valuing access to goods and services rather than the burdens of outright ownership. And this has tremendous impact when it comes to sustainability and sustainable consumption, as well as community connectedness. Now, fast forward a few more years, what happens during this time? The internet continues to grow along with significant growth in social media and new forms of technology to connect with more people in more ways. We also know that there was, at this time, a global economic crisis. But what I want to underscore tonight is that what propels the growth in the collaborative economy is not caused by the global economic crisis. What's going on predates it and is far bigger than it, although it is fair to say that the economic crisis did catalyze its growth a bit more. Also during this time, we saw the emergence of a new kind of company. It was so small then that you probably didn't even notice it. What began as two roommates named Brian and Joe, who were struggling to afford rent in San Francisco. And at the time, there was a big convention in town and not enough hotel rooms. So Brian and Joe had the idea, what if we took an airbed and put it in our living room and invited people to stay with us and they could pay us and help us defray our rent? Like Pierre, they were a bit surprised when dozens of people contacted them saying they were interested in staying with them. And in the end, three different people stayed and they had a great time getting to know these people. In the process, Airbnb was born. Today, Airbnb is a global peer-to-peer -peer accommodation marketplace. On Airbnb, you can find all kinds of properties, extra rooms in your home, your holiday house. None of these properties are owned by Airbnb or a company. They're owned by people like you and me. Here in Toronto, there are about 900 properties. Vancouver has about 700. Montreal has more than 1,000 properties on Airbnb. But what's really interesting is it's not just extra rooms in your house. You can find all kinds of things on Airbnb. Igloos, converted airplanes, even the entire principality of Liechtenstein for rent on Airbnb. That has two main effects. First, we're giving these properties access to markets and an audience that they never had before. We're creating brand new markets. This igloo did not have a global audience. You could put out a sign saying igloo for rent, but how many people were you going to get? Now the world can see you simply by going to the Airbnb platform. Secondly, we're enabling the people with these assets to generate income. So for example, this treehouse, the income from the treehouse is often 
sufficient to pay the mortgage on the main house out front. Think about what this means for reimagining marketplaces and also lifestyles. So where does this bring us today in 2014 and what does this mean for the future? A few observations. First, we have seen an explosion of new technologies that enable us to connect more people, more things to share in new ways. In particular, we're interested in those technologies that enable us to connect people and items, assets, with what we call idling capacity, the untapped value in underutilized assets, the 23 hours a day that the car sits idle. Now, idling capacity exists everywhere. Think about the things that sit unused, stuck, idle in your home, in a business's supply chain, or throughout a city. This is proving to be one of the most transformative new ways of connecting that we have seen in modern times. Technology innovation is one of four key drivers that we see underpinning a lot of what's happening in the collaborative economy. Alongside technology, we're also seeing more broadly a values shift towards systems and relationships and business models that are more open, more human, and more connected. We're seeing economic realities that the 2008 crisis brought home. We're also seeing a series of environmental pressures, population growth, limited natural resources, and the effects of climate change being increasingly felt. These four drivers together are having a massive effect on how we live, how we work, how we dream, and how we think about the future. Third, we're looking at what we call the great power and trust shift. Power and trust are shifting away from centralized institutions towards decentralized networks of individuals. Big corporations and big governments are amongst the least trusted institutions in the world. Meanwhile, things that previously only a big company could produce or create or, or imagine, now it's possible again for people like you and me to come together thanks to these new technologies and do things that heretofore were not possible. And we've seen how disruptive this has been for different markets. Think about publishing or banking. And what's interesting, is we're really only at the beginning stage of the sectors that are to be disrupted. And the saying kind of goes, you're either going to disrupt or be disrupted. And really, when we pull together all of these different trends, so new technologies, new values, drivers, and a great power and trust shift, what we see is that we may well be at the very beginning of what we could think of as a peer revolution, of which we're only seeing the tip of the iceberg. Now, yes, this might make you go, oh my goodness, what does that mean next? I look at this and I see a world of opportunity and abundance that we have never before imagined. So when we look at today in 2014, the collaborative economy as a whole, what do we see? Well, one thing we see, it is pervasive. This is taking place in pretty much every sector you can imagine. The saying is no longer, what can you share? But rather, what can't you share? And the best examples I've come up with so far are toothbrushes and wedding rings. I used to say children until a lot of people said, no, I will gladly share my kids with you. Secondly, this is global. This is taking place in cities of all sizes around the world. It's catching the attention of media. These are magazine covers from the last year. And that guy on the left is Brian from Airbnb. It's also attracting the attention of investors. And it's estimated that at the end of 2013, more than $2 billion have been invested in the collaborative economy. It was featured at Davos, at the World Economic Forum last year, um, sorry, last month, and it's getting, we get hits of media publications, literally multiple of them on a daily basis. Here in Canada, it was mentioned by Charles briefly, this is just a sampling of the kinds of media that we've seen in the last six months. Nora Young hosted a CBC Spark program on the sharing economy. 
the collaborative economy being featured as one of the top ideas in 2014 here. There is what's called the Sharing Project in Vancouver, which is a phenomenal initiative that now has the support also of the local government. And we also know that here in Toronto, there is a thriving swap and barter community. Again, this is just a sampling of what's out there. And what has this meant for the companies themselves? Well, this is a map of Airbnb in 2008, shortly after they launched. The pink dots are where there are Airbnb properties. Fast forward not even five years and you get this. This, and this kind of map is playing out in cities around the world. Airbnb today has properties, has more than 500,000 properties in more than 34,000 cities in 192 countries around the world. I've traveled on Airbnb from California to Canada to London to Italy to Rwanda. Airbnb itself did not know they had properties in Rwanda until I told them. But think about what this means for how you can travel in new ways and connect with a new community. Meanwhile, while I'm in Rwanda, if I wanted, I could put my home in San Francisco on Airbnb at the same time. This is having a massive effect, again, not just on marketplaces, but on lifestyles, on communities, and on cities. So, let's pause for a moment. I want to take just a second and talk a little bit about vocabulary, simply so that all of us can talk about this using common terminology moving forward. One of our goals this week is to connect dots, and one of the easiest ways to make sure we can do that is to be using similar language so that we're comparing apples to apples, so to speak. Once we've done this, we're gonna dive back into a, several more examples. So, at a basic level, when we talk about the sharing economy, what we're really talking about is sharing of assets with idling capacity, and by doing so, using them more sustainably and efficiently. In effect, when we share an asset with idling capacity, we're unlocking wealth and unlocking value that was in this asset before, but was invisible to us before. Now remember, sharing can happen with or without money. You can do it to generate income, or you can do it simply because it's a good thing to do. It also can happen with or without technology. You can use a website or an app, or you can imagine sharing with your neighborhood that doesn't require fancy technology. It is true, however, that technology massively expands the number of people and the number of things you can connect with to share. The sharing economy is also often called collaborative consumption. Collaborative consumption refers to the reinvention of traditional marketplace transactions, so swapping, renting, borrowing, lending, gifting, through technology in ways and on a scale never before possible. So what this is doing is reimagining not just what we consume, but how we consume. And this is leading to the ability for people to have more collaborative lifestyles, for example, to travel with Airbnb. And also to reimagine marketplaces where wealth and needs and haves can be redistributed more efficiently. And where it gets really interesting is if we take the collaborative consumption piece and zoom out and see how collaborative consumption is just one piece of a much larger pie called the collaborative economy. So here, we're talking not just about collaborative forms of consumption, but also collaborative production, so things like the maker movement, collaborative financing, things like crowdfunding, and collaborative learning, so things like online skill sharing platforms. When you look at it from this perspective, I get really excited, but I can also say quite comfortably that everyone here in the room today has already been affected in some way by the collaborative economy, even though you might not have called it that. Hopefully we can start having a conversation moving forward where we are using these same terms so that we can figure, what more, figure out what more we might do together. Now let's dive back into some more examples about how the collaborative economy is reimagining marketplaces, lifestyles, and cities. Another great example of idling capacity. 80% of all rides taken are solo rides. Again, seemingly normal behavior, which is tremendously wasteful, economically and environmentally. 
Enter Lyft. Lyft is a real-time ride-sharing community. It enables people like you and me to transport our neighbors and our fellow city residents around using our own car and setting our own hours. Lyft is a company that recruits and background checks, again, people from the community who want to serve as Lyft drivers and want to set their own hours. So when I need to go somewhere, I log on to the Lyft app, say, yeah, I need to go somewhere. A Lyft driver agrees to come pick me up, takes me where I need to go, drops me off. I pay him or her through the app. We peer review each other about the experience and we're done. In the process, Lyft reduces the cost of transportation, reduces CO2 emissions, and reduces congestion in cities. This really redefines the marketplace. Getting from A to B has never been easier. But Lyft isn't just about economics and the community, economics and the environment. It's also about a sense of fun and community. And I should mention that Lyft is also one of the fastest growing companies in this space. It currently exists in 19 cities across the United States. It's now offered multiple million rides and it's growing almost explosively. I suspect that by now it's not even, last weekend it was 19 cities. I suspect by the end of this week it'll be 20. But in addition, Lyft is about creating a culture of fun. And you only need to look as far as this pink mustache, otherwise known as a car stash, to know that you're in a Lyft vehicle. And so for those people who are thinking, what in the world, you're gonna get in a car with a stranger? Think of this, you know exactly what car you're getting into. And the Lyft platform, if you look at the background checks and the requirements to become a Lyft driver, they are higher on every single count than what's required to become a taxi driver. Also, when you get in a Lyft vehicle, the typical way that you greet the driver is with a fist bump. It's kind of fun, you can see the fist bump there. Lyft is not just about fun though, it's also about building community. And on one hand, you can think about the community of passengers that can now travel more affordably and have a bit more fun while they do so. But what's been really interesting is to see how Lyft has also created or is building a community of drivers. A lot of Lyft drivers have some kind of other passion or career that they're pursuing. Maybe it's acting or music or becoming a chef, who knows what. And because they can set their own hours, the income from Lyft helps them support these other activities in a flexible way. But what we've seen are also, is also that Lyft drivers are collaborating with one another in ways that go beyond Lyft. They're doing things together, they're creating companies and so forth. In addition, this is just one example of how the Lyft community is really having fun and coming together. This is called Lyft Creatives. A lot of Lyft drivers get very excited and they're very proud of their cars and, and being a Lyft driver. So some of them do special things for their guests. One bakes cookies, different kind of cookie every day. Another one has karaoke in their car. And another one has, in effect, a small library where while you're taking the trip with that person, you're writing short stories, creating haikus and poetry. Think about this. This is a new kind of community and a new kind of marketplace that we haven't seen before. And also think about how this plays out for the overall health and well-being of a city. Now, despite its benefits, Lyft has encountered more than its fair share of challenges. Most importantly, most significantly, has been in the regulatory space. So Lyft is a great example of how a collaborative economy company operates often in a gray area. Lyft is not a taxi, but there is no regulation that really fits it. As a result, Lyft has encountered multiple fines and bans and cease and desist letters and court cases. And it seemed like last year, every other week, there was some new legal issue, legal case that they had to fight. But gradually, we're seeing regulators take note of the power and the benefits of this kind of economic activity. And in an historic event milestone last fall, the California Public Utilities Commission, which is the main transportation regulator in the state of California, which is where a lot of these companies get started, not all of them, but it's a pretty important uh, regulatory body, unanimously voted to establish a new kind of transportation company called a TNC, Transportation Network Corporation, which gives Lyft and other ride-sharing companies express authority to operate. I believe that this is a real precursor of what is to come, and imagine if someday 
Lyft and other ride-sharing services like it are truly mainstream in a city. It's incredibly exciting. Now, let's look at another example from here, locally, that has global importance. Another wonderful example of idling capacity is a power drill. Some of you probably know, a power drill on average costs $100 and is used 14 minutes in its entire life. <laughs> Whereas you don't need the drill, you need the hole. And that is a very expensive hole. <laughs> now, the to a tool library takes care of this. And here in Toronto, the Toronto Tool Library is a wonderful example. How it works is basically you sign up to become a member of the Tool Library. You pay an annual membership, which is less than the cost of a tool, uh, less than the cost of a power drill. And you get access to the drill and a whole lot more. You get tools for gardening and bicycle maintenance and so on. So think about it for a moment. Why wouldn't you do this? For less than the cost of a drill, you can access the drill and a whole lot more. And tool libraries are another great example of what you can do without a lot of money and without a lot of technology. You could imagine coming together in your neighborhood and creating a smaller version of a tool library and not charging anyone anything and not having a website or anything like that. This is also something that's really easy for a city to sponsor if it wants to promote sustainable consumption as well as neighborhood resilience. And we've seen an explosion also in neighborhood-focused, sharing-based libraries and platforms like it. So, for example, we see Street Bank in the UK, Peerby in the Netherlands, and a new platform called Yertle in the United States, all of which are different variations on this ability for neighborhoods and communities to share with one another. Now, if we take the tool library concept and zoom out, we end up at Tech Shop. Tech Shop is part hackerspace, part studio, and part learning center. They consider themselves a playground for creativity. And similar to a tool library, Tech Shop operates on a membership basis. So you pay a monthly or annual membership to get unlimited access to tools there. But when we're looking at tools at Tech Shop, we're not talking about power drills. We're talking about 3D printers, laser cutters, quilting machines, sophisticated tools that previously individuals could not own and they could not access easily. We're looking at tools that are so sophisticated that many businesses are able to prototype early stage products. So if any of you know Square, the payments mechanism, Square was prototyped at Tech Shop. So think about what this means if somebody, an entrepreneur wants to start a business. They now can do that, whereas before they had no such access. And this is not only reimagining marketplaces and reimagining lifestyles, but what we're also doing is creating an environment that stimulates innovation and that encourages collaborative production. So think about how this plays out if you're a city leader or working in local government. This is exactly the kind of activity you want to support and promote. And I should mention on the tool library, there's one other um, detail that I wanted to mention. We're not able to feature it tonight, but CSI has just produced a really wonderful video highlighting the Toronto Tool Library. I would strongly recommend that you check it out. Now, another example. Let's go to the UK and look at one of my favorite examples. This is Good Gym. Good Gym is about getting fit by doing good. It was founded by a group of runners who got really frustrated by the amount of wasted energy and human potential they saw in gyms. Meanwhile, they were feeling really disconnected to the community. So what they did is establish a platform on which good gym runners become members and perform certain tasks on behalf of the community. So for example, they go on what are called missions. Somebody makes a mission request to the good gym platform. And usually, in all cases, it's somebody, it's a homebound or isolated person, somebody who can't do this task themselves. So maybe it's that they need a light bulb exchanged, or maybe they need something delivered. A good gym runner agrees to take the mission, runs to that person's house, repairs the light bulb, runs back, we're done. Didn't cost anything, but think about the needs and haves that we're matching. The person has their has their task met, and the good gym runner did something for the community and met a fellow member. Similarly, even more interesting, I think, are what they call coaching runs. 
A good gym runner is paired with a coach who is also an elderly, homebound, or otherwise isolated person. They agree to go for a run perhaps once a week. Again, I'm going to run to your house. I'm going to share a cup of coffee with you, deliver a paper, have a chat. I may well be the only person that homebound individual sees all week. I am a ray of sunshine in their day. Then I run home and, and we're done. Again, doesn't cost anything. Extremely simple, but extremely powerful. Think about the needs and haves that were met. Maybe the only personal contact she gets all week. And he has gotten fit, done some good, and connected with his community. Now, if we think about how this plays out for cities, Good Gym has also been very interesting. In the UK, the National Health Service has started to recognize, thanks to Good Gym, a couple of things. One, how widespread and challenging and deep and, and problematic the number of homebound and isolated people are, are in cities. And secondly, how they were spending so much of their money on healthcare services inefficiently. So in turn, NHS has partnered with Good Gym, along with several boroughs and councils there, to rethink healthcare services and delivery. And I think that Good Gym is a perfect example of social innovation, where we're looking at the means to, challenge, to, to solving this problem being social, and the ends being very social. And what we're looking at is transitioning from seeing people as vulnerable individuals to actually being more resilient when they're connected with others. One final example that's at the intersection of the future of work, micro-entrepreneurship, and skills sharing. This is Leah and her dog, Kobe. Leah is the founder of a company called TaskRabbit, and Kobe is responsible for its founding. The story goes something like this. It was a cold winter night in Boston, and Lee and her husband were about to go out on a date night when they realized that Kobe had no food. And you know what happened next. <laughs> it's like, there goes the date night. We need to go get food for Kobe, and uh, now you know, we're going to be late and all the rest. In that moment, Leah thought, wouldn't it be great if I could log onto a website and ask somebody to please go get some dog food, bring it over to Kobe, give him food and a scratch behind the ears, I'll pay you for your services, we'll go enjoy our date night and we're done. In that moment, TaskRabbit was born. You can think of TaskRabbit a little bit like eBay for errands and how it works again, you log on to the website, you submit a task that needs to be done, task rabbits, people that are willing and able to perform these tasks, bid on it, perform it, you pay them through the app, you peer review each other again, and you're done. And there's a wide variety of tasks. I almost hesitate to call them tasks because it sounds so almost menial. All kinds of services that you can provide on TaskRabbit. It is things like running errands and doing delivery, but also things like handymen, computer repair, research, and one of my favorites, helping somebody write a love letter. Now these, think about what this means for matching needs and haves. People who didn't have the time or the ability or the inclination to do something are matched with people who do, who also in turn can generate some income and meet others within the community. Very simple but very powerful platform. What's also interesting is that 70% of TaskRabbits are unemployed or underemployed when they join the platform. Each one of these people is a new kind of micro-entrepreneur and together, they do form a new kind of community. Very interesting to see who TaskRabbits are. By and large, the majority of TaskRabbits are people who have skills, but need a flexible work arrangement, or who have been traditionally excluded from mainstream work opportunities. Mothers with young children and retirees. TaskRabbit gives them the ability to use their skills, generate some income, and connect with their community. Now, I am not saying that TaskRabbit is going to solve the global jobs crisis, nothing like it. What I'm talking about is that TaskRabbit is providing an ability to create a livelihood that did not exist before. And it's working pretty well when, at a time when a lot of these other bigger job solutions are not. 
So if we look at a couple of examples, this is Chris. He's known as a super rabbit because he has done a lot of work on TaskRabbit. And Chris is a handyman. He was unemployed before finding, underemployed, before finding the platform. And Chris found that he was really good at doing the number one requested task on TaskRabbit, something we can all relate to, assembling IKEA furniture. He has gone on to create a small business, a thriving business, on this kind of furniture assembly. Again, this didn't exist before, and we're matching needs and haves, and he now has a livelihood. It's not just about uh, handyman services or, or technical services, if you will. Here's another great example. This woman, her, her son was in hospital, actually undergoing chemotherapy. She could not be there to care for him. So she went to TaskRabbit and vetted a whole bunch of rabbits and ultimately found Michelle, asked Michelle to go purchase a blanket and a robe and some healthy snacks and to go visit her son in hospital every few days and then report back how he's doing. They did this and actually ended up talking almost every day until he was released from hospital. Think about the needs and haves that were met here. Mom feels much better than if she'd had no contact with her son. Michelle has done something really good for the community and earned a bit of income. And the son feels more connected as well. But in addition, Michelle and his mom have formed a relationship, a friendship, of trust and of understanding that didn't exist before. Not surprisingly, we see quite a few tasks on TaskRabbit related to healthcare. So things like taking somebody to the doctor's office or picking up a prescription. And in fact, Walmart partnered with TaskRabbit recently to help expedite pharmacy delivery. We've also seen in other countries platforms modeled on TaskRabbit or inspired by TaskRabbit take root. So for example, back in the UK, the Macmillan Cancer Center has formed a cancer support group, again, on the TaskRabbit model. And in Australia, there's a platform called Silver Troopers, focused on elderly care. Think about how this plays out again, marketplaces, lifestyles, cities, and how it really is underpinning TaskRabbit's main mission, which is to help people help one another. And before you get too worried, if you like this whole TaskRabbit idea, uh, TaskRabbit exists in the US and the UK, but here in Toronto and also in Montreal, there is a Canadian equivalent called Kutoto, smaller. Don't know if it has all of the same tasks, but it's really about getting things done locally. Now, we've done this mini tour of some different examples. What I want to underscore here, and what is probably, for me, the most exciting, most amazing thing about the collaborative economy, is that it's one concept, but it has so many different dimensions and so many different manifestations. And think about it. The collaborative economy can happen with or without money, with or without technology. It's something you can do with your neighbor or somebody halfway around the world. It's something you can do because you want to boost your own pocketbook and help your own individual sustainability, or because you want to boost local economic investment in the community. It doesn't matter. You can do this because you actually want to make money or save money or both, do something good for the planet. And people show up in this space for lots of different reasons. I love the fact that it has such a wide appeal to such a wide range of audiences. But what I want you to understand is this is all connected. And that in fact, the diversity of reasons why people do show up and participate in the collaborative economy is one of its greatest strengths. So let's shift gears now briefly and talk about what this means specifically for cities and what is a shareable city. To date and tonight, a lot of what we've been talking about is happening in the, public, in the private sector. Companies and entrepreneurs and individuals getting involved. By and large, cities and policymakers have not really been a voice at the table, with a couple of exceptions which we'll talk about in a moment. However, when you think about it, the city is arguably the single largest beneficiary of what's going on here. Think about the challenges that city leaders face, the pressures of urbanization, shrinking budgets, climate change, again, all kinds of pressures. But when you look at 
a city through a collaborative economy lens, I joke that it's kind of like putting on goggles where you have x-ray vision to see idling capacity in assets. If you were to do that and just walk down the street in a city, you start discovering wealth and capacity and assets all over the place and in the process, you start to reimagine the city itself. So on one hand, you can think about how a city might apply collaborative economy principles to its own operations and become a sharing platform and put some of the assets that it owns into shared use. Again, because it wants to earn income or because it's just a good thing to do with a lot of public benefit. In addition though, shareable cities and policymakers in particular have a key role to play around creating an enabling environment. So the rules and the policies and the regulations to help this space thrive. So what are some cities in the world doing to become more shareable? Well, in the United States last summer, the mayors of 15 cities, including San Francisco, New York, Boston, Philadelphia, Chicago, Los Angeles, the big players, and also lesser known, smaller, mid-sized cities like Des Moines, Iowa, and Louisville, Kentucky, signed the Shareable Cities Resolution, declaring their support for the sharing economy. These efforts are now going global, and I would love to sign up any Canadian city. Uh, maybe we'll be able to do that this week. If we go down to Brazil, we see that Airbnb has partnered with the governments of Rio and Sao Paulo in advance of the World Cup and the Olympics. They're going to ensure that more people can travel in more ways and more sustainably, and also that more of the money invested and spent on these events remains invested locally and benefits a much wider cross-section of the community. If we go over to Sydney, Australia, we see that the government there has sponsored what they call the Share Sydney Guide, which is very simple. It's a booklet. It's a tool that helps people understand what the sharing economy and collaborative economies are and provides a wealth of resources for what's happening in the city and how people can get involved. And then if we go north from Sydney, we end up in Seoul, South Korea, which is quite probably, I'm pretty sure at this point, the world's most shareable city. Thanks to the vision and forward thinking of its mayor. He is really looking at the collaborative economy as one of the core pillars to define his entire urban planning strategy. He's passed legislation, he's committed investment funds, they're incubating companies, and as he likes to say, he sees the city as a sharing laboratory. Now, I think that city leaders who understand this space today and start to embrace it and start to experiment and start to look at it in this new way and see abundance rather than scarcity will become world leaders in the years to come. Now, as I mentioned, despite the benefits of becoming a shareable city, there are some challenges. And the biggest single challenge that we see today is policy. Why? Because most of the rules that currently govern collaborative economy companies were created before any of these companies existed, and oftentimes before the internet itself. So what you get are really clunky rules where clearly a law was not intended to apply to a particular situation, or more often, what we call a regulatory gray area. You cannot tell if a law applies or not. And this leads to all kinds of friction and challenges, not just for policymakers, but for the companies, for the users, and for investors. Sometimes these challenges are expected, like when a law is clearly outdated. Other times they're unexpected, which we've seen here in Canada. For example, you want to establish a bike sharing program, but you only realize further down the road that it needs to comply with mandatory helmet laws, meaning you have to kind of rework things a bit. Other issues that commonly arise relate to insurance, taxation, and a really big one, which is the difference between personal and commercial use. So at what point does renting an extra room in your home to help make ends meet become a business? Now, these are thorny issues. Policymakers are hesitant to tackle them, and they don't want to rock the boat. In addition, there's no easy way for them to learn about what other cities are doing. 
However, what I want to underscore tonight is that these challenges are not unique to the collaborative economy. These are issues that policymakers have been faced with for time immemorial. They're part of the natural process of innovation itself. And the example I often use is a car. When the car was first introduced, there were laws in many cities saying, you can drive a car so long as it doesn't go faster than a horse and buggy. It seems ludicrous to us now, but you can imagine where the car is a new vehicle and we don't know quite what to do with it. That's more or less the space we're in today with the collaborative economy. So get ready for a very interesting ride and again, tons of opportunities for policymakers. Now one area where there's very little debate that the collaborative economy can help cities is in the space of resilience planning and emergency management. So. For example, after Hurricane Sandy in New York City, hundreds of Airbnb hosts contacted the company saying they would like to offer accommodation for free. Makes sense. The city ended up partnering with Airbnb and the company played a key role in disaster recovery. Think about the floods in Calgary last summer. Mayor Nenshi did an extraordinary job managing the disaster, but think about if there were collaborative economy companies and platforms in place, how those efforts might have been improved. One really good example of how the collaborative economy can help resilience planning takes us back to San Francisco and an organization called BayShare, which, which is a consortium of collaborative economy companies whose mission is to promote resilience planning in the city. They have partnered with the Department of Emergency Management and they have a seat on the Disaster Council. And how it works is that each company agrees in advance to share some part of its assets, its platform, its community, so that at the time when disaster strikes, should it strike, they're more equipped to respond in a more resilient way. Because as we all know, there's no better time to plan for an emergency than when there isn't one. So finally, turning to Canada, what do we see here in terms of shareable cities? Well, as I mentioned, I'm not aware of any Canadian city that has declared itself to be a shareable city yet, though we would love to help change that. We do see a lot of ad hoc initiatives and, and dabbling around. As I mentioned, the sharing project in Vancouver, which is an excellent example of how a community can learn more about sharing and how a government can get involved. We see various green city and, and greenest city efforts and mandates uh, in most cities in Canada. And I was interested to find out as I was preparing for this that in fact many Canadian embassies around the world actually share space with UK embassies. Again, maybe they're doing that to save money, maybe they're doing that because it's good for the environment, maybe they're doing that to build better relationships. It doesn't matter to me why they're doing it. The fact is it's a more sustainable, resilient, efficient solution. What I want to ask and challenge you all to do tonight is to think about what do you want to see and how can you help make that happen? Opportunities abound for companies, for governments, for individuals. We really have all of the dots. We can see all of the dots. It's just about connecting them in new ways. And that's a good segue to my final point, which is the announcement of the launch of Cities for People this week. As was mentioned, Cities for People is a national initiative that's exploring how to enhance economic, ecological, and social well-being, and how to build more sustainable, resilient cities. As you've hopefully seen, a lot of what we see in the collaborative economy and shareable cities mesh really neatly with the Cities for People vision. And so one of the mandates is how does Cities for People carry these ideas forward? And there really is no better time to get involved than now and no better place to do so than here. So with that, I look forward to building a more shareable, collaborative future together. Thank you. What's that? Are we here? I think, I think so. Okay. Gonna... There we go. Yeah. I, mean... I guess I'm done with this. Okay. <clears throat> Hello? Thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah? Okay. So thank you very much for that. Um, it's fascinating, and I was thinking as I was watching it that uh, the precursor to the, uh, of course, 
as you mentioned, the internet has made uh, the sharing economy, it, it's like steroids for the sharing economy, yeah. right? Or more than steroids, it's a magical growth serum. But, but um, fractional reserve banking, to me, seems to be mm -hmm. a system based on access rather than mm -hmm. uh, constant ownership, mm -hmm. and uh, it powered the Industrial Revolution. So, uh, but, and there are many economists and, and people who think that fractional reserve banking, the introduction of a system that lets you uh, put money you're not using to work, it will be loaned to other people, and then you have access to it later, um, actually created the entire transformation that allowed sort of Western capitalist uh, the, everything we know now to exist. Um, and I imagine that the sharing economy we're talking about here potentially has similarly transformative uh, effects. Mm -hmm. Now, as somebody who works full-time as a journalist, um, I, I talk a lot uh, inside the business about the way that the sharing economy has already affected our business. This is not to, but I, um, I think when we're talking about policy obstacles or whatnot, mm -hmm. um, that I wanted to ask a little bit about um, the approaches to some of the things. Because if you are a publisher mm -hmm. and you, you see the, uh, and the internet has allowed most people to seize the means of production for publishing, right? Um, everybody in the world can immediately share, they can self publish, uh, which has created massive disruption, uh, which is thought to be a bad thing by people who were formerly professionals. Now, in the case of car ride sharing services, mm -hmm. I imagine that the similar objections, uh, the, the fears would emerge from taxi cab owners mm -hmm. who paid hundreds of thousands of dollars for plates, who have uh, regularly hur regulatory hurdles they have to jump over, et cetera, et cetera. And in the case of something like TaskRabbit, I imagine that there are any number of licensed professionals or uh, licensed companies providing certain mm -hmm. services who view this as unfair competition. Mm -hmm. So I guess the question that I have um, is that given the obvious goods, uh, good effects uh, for sustainability, for community building, for everything else, um, how do we as a society, how do policymakers, how do people in cities try to navigate those hurdles, right? Mm -hmm. the, the transformation. I mean, and this is, and this is always, whenever we're talking about massive disruption, disruption in an industry, then, then these are the questions mm -hmm. that would come up. But so say you, to, to narrow this down a little bit, sorry, I realize it's vague, but I was thinking while you were talking. You should have been um, at our policy workshop earlier yeah, today. <laughs> but but in, in the case of, uh, of, of say, the ride sharing mm -hmm. services and whatnot, mm -hmm. how, how should we approach that? Is, is not the hipster mustache car share service not just an unlicensed cab company? Um, or not? Right, so that's quite a question. Um, <laughs> let's see, where do I want to tackle that? So I do think absolutely there is a role for government to play. That's what I'm saying. This is not just, it's not about regulate it like we were doing it before or don't regulate it at all. What we need is actually to design a set of rules that is applicable, that actually is appropriate to the kinds of business that we're conducting. Now, a government plays a key role in quality control and issues where there is public safety, public security to think about. But that's not what we're looking at is you don't want to treat apples like oranges. And so a couple things that come to mind. One is in the case of Lyft, for example, it got to the point where they were like, we get the benefits. We recognize, quite candidly, they said, we recognize that the taxi industry isn't the most efficient, isn't the best running. And as I like to say, show me a city where taxis work well and I'll move there. Uh, we need more supply. We need a little bit more competitive nimbleness. So what they did was not try to, ta to regulate Lyft like a taxi, but they created this transportation network corporation. So Lyft is now subject to all kinds of regulations, but regulations that actually see it for what it is. Right. So it's just a more suitable container for it to be in. In addition, though, what I think is important to keep in mind, there are some people out there that say, oh, this is all about peer review and self-regulation and just, you know, if your peers say you're great, then why do you need to worry about external regulation? For some things, that may work okay. And in fairness, TaskRabbit is a pretty good example. TaskRabbit is complying with every single law but there aren't really that many laws that hit it because task rabbits are not employees of the company. They're not even really contractors. They're free agents. 
Mm -hmm. Now, we can have a debate about whether or not the government needs to play a more proactive role to provide for the benefits and the needs of TaskRabbits, but that's separate as to whether they're complying with the laws. What you find is that on TaskRabbit, and even on Airbnb, candidly, peer reviews go a really, really far away. And if you have a bad review, you're out of the system pretty quickly. So there's a market mechanism that comes into play Yeah, that's well. I mean, I was going to ask, and it's a bit of a different question. And the floor is open to questions, by the way. We have a couple microphones there, and you can uh, go up to them. But, but before we get to questions from the audience, I, I'll just lead in, is that mm. as you were uh, going over all of this, it seemed to me that, that there's one big question for, for people who are just entering many aspects of the sharing economy. Mm -hmm. And maybe for people uh, looking to run businesses in it or start up businesses in it too, and it's is that trust seems to be such an important factor in so many of these transactions. And people who uh, who've never used a service uh, before would say, "Well, how do I how do I know? Like, where's the authority telling me?" Mm -hmm. um, and and it sounds to me like the, most of the authority is coming so far, or in many of these cases, from peer reviews. That is one. So it's funny, if I were to do another presentation here at Mars, it would be on trust and reputation and what that means, those things as forms of capital. Mm -hmm. So you will in the future not just think about your credit history as are you a good character, but you will really look at new ways that we can develop trust and reputation profiles of is this person trustworthy? And what we find is that there are all kinds of ways that you can gauge somebody's trust and reputation, both online and then offline. And all of the platforms, certainly the ones that are growing most quickly, are tapping into multiple tools to do that, uh, which can include you know, online verification, but then also reviews from other people. So we can identify, are you a real person, and you know, what's your, where's your online profile, but then also hearing what other people have to say about you. And at, over time, there's a certain level of consistency, usually, that evolves. But trust and reputation, I could have mentioned, too, even back as far as eBay, on that slide with the two people, where I said, you know, this is really about matching needs and haves and building marketplaces with inventory. I can also say it's about not just creating efficiency of markets, but about the ability for technology to create trust between neighbors, but also between strangers. And think about what eBay, that long ago, you were going to send your money to somebody to buy something? And like, how do you know things are going to arrive? That now seems like we wouldn't usually think twice about buying something from a highly rated eBay seller, which sort of <laughs> seems like a pretty good bet. But you don't know that person. So think of that as, I think, version 1.0. And right. now we're evolving into 2.0. And also, we're looking at sharing different kinds of things in different levels of intimacy, quite candidly. And there's almost a spectrum where it plays out. The level, you can think about sharing of assets where it's really an arm's length transaction, and I don't feel like my personal privacy has been invaded in any way. But then at the other extreme, you do have things like Airbnb, where some people are like, having people stay in my house? Like, that's pretty intimate. And that's where you want, there's almost a correlation between how many layers of verification that you want. And companies that succeed are going to be those that can provide that level or that number of tools to build and verify that trust. Right. Hi. Hi, my name is Kay. I'm from uh, Studio Y that's just down the hall. And um, something clicked while you were talking. I've been doing a research project on clean cook stoves and the marketing, mm -hmm. distribution, and adoption of them. Um, and so, in fact, um, a sharing economy of multiple t cook stoves that were um, specialized for certain dishes would work really well. Um, the one thing I'm coming up against is uh, how do you deal with lots of people needing the stoves at the same time or a product in general at the same time? Um, mm -hmm. I can think to community kitchens and making more dishes um, in large batches, but are there specific ways to deal with that issue? Thanks. That's a great question, and it's always around car sharing. What do you do at rush hour, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And this also, I will say, speaks to idling capacity. So I have a partial answer to what you're talking about. Um, and we'll often, you know, we often slice and dice what things are best suited for sharing. And, you know, the mm -hmm. best thing to share is something that costs a lot of money and is not used very often. It's just like built for sharing. Things that are in functional use often, mm -hmm. you're going to need to actually have an inventory there. And the point I want to make is when I talk about idling capacity, to say that a car sits idle 95% of the time, which is you know, what we're looking at, that's pretty bad. I'm not looking, though, at a society. I don't think it's realistic to think about a society in which cars are 
in use 23 hours a day either, the reverse of that. But we're looking, imagine even if cars were in, in use half the time. Massive improvement over what we see now. And so similarly, in the case of cook stoves, I wouldn't be, you're going to need some lax inventory, but that's where you start looking at why do people need it at specific times? We see this a lot in the case of um, sharing of different kinds of space, for instance. Mm -hmm. And I believe it's happening here, I know it's happening in Vancouver, a little bit here in Toronto as well, where we now see space that used to be just a restaurant open at night for supper. They're now open in the morning for a person to do baking. They're open at lunch for somebody else to be a, more of a pop-up restaurant. And they're open in the evening for the restaurant as itself. So in the case of cook stoves, you really actually want to do an analysis not just of supply, but of demand. And is there any calibration that can happen there? But at the end of the day, you will need some lax inventory mm -hmm. to cover peak hours. And we see that with car sharing as well. Are there many... Uh examples where people use price to moderate that demand too because certainly at certain times of the day like if if, if I was the car share rush hour example mm -hmm. is yep. that you know ideally I go to work at the same time as everybody else and I come home yep. at some at the same time as somebody else but if if it was half the price for me to travel an hour later then, and then I might be yeah. able to adjust my working hours to and that's exactly what's happening. And actually, you know, in fairness, we track which companies are succeeding. We also track which companies are failing. We track which companies are really performing true to mission and we're, like with a community spirit. And we also track like what companies are kind of rubbing some people the wrong way. And if anyone has heard of Uber, great example. And Uber, I mean, it's, a, it's exploding in terms of growth. But Uber, there was a recent hullabaloo around surge pricing. Does that ring a bell for anybody? Mm -hmm. So surge pricing in New York City, where high peak hours and New, York, New Year's Eve and all the rest would result in a spike. And the for people them, who don't like it call it gouging. The people who yeah, do like surging, it. Yeah, surging, gouging, exactly. Yeah. And it prompted a really big debate. And I mean, I will say candidly, I, I don't agree at all with what, how the company looked at this. But they're using an algorithm to determine when you surge, when you, when surge pricing kicks in, and there was a snowstorm. It was around New Year's. Long story short, we saw this is at an extreme, yeah. but you saw that it cost two hundred dollars to go two blocks, and people were like, "Well, that, that's just not right." Now, granted, <laughs> we've seen a backlash to that, and and so on and so forth. That's an extreme example and yet, of and how yet, we can use cost to control. The, the reason why the algorithm would produce that price is because there are people willing to pay it, right? right. And so the, right. It, well, and the challenge it, really yeah. arose when people got into the cars, not realizing that surge uh, pricing was in right. effect, okay. and now there is a there taking the approach of full disclosure, full transparency. Before you get in the vehicle, you know what it will cost and so forth. But cost, and that's where, as I like to say, we can look at this with or without money and all the rest, but there is absolutely a role for uh, market mechanisms. And to that end, too, super rabbits can charge more for their services and they will still get demand. Airbnb hosts with stellar reviews, same property, roughly, same neighborhood, can charge a little bit more. And I think that's a really, great way also to reward people who are deeply in involved and committed to this space. Hi, that was a great talk, thank you. Thank you. Um, I think one of the things that I find particularly interesting is the ability of, for the sharing economy to, a to offer kind of customized um, help, uh, mm -hmm. you know, from people who need the help and people who can provide the help. Mm -hmm. But one concern uh, or one challenge that I see is um, the question of the digital divide. Like for example, in the good gym, you had the scenario of an elderly person who doesn't see people. And I found it very unlikely that that person would have the, um, the insight or the savvy, the wherewithal to connect to such um, a network. So um, I, I really liked your, um, when you mentioned that the city of New York um, paired up with Airbnb, to kind of interlace mm -hmm. their conventional um, emergency response strategy with this, uh, you know, sharing economy infrastructure. I really like that interlacing. And my question to you is whether you can think of other examples of um, sharing economy networks that have interlaced themselves with more conventional um, solution providers. Um, yeah, like uh, another uh, um, case that comes to mind is in Toronto, there's some highways that have carpooling lanes mm -hmm. and uh, um, like uh, high occupancy vehicle lanes, and there are signs saying, 
you know, high occupancy vehicle lanes, but there's a conspicuous absence of any indication for how somebody can go about finding someone to carpool with. Mm -hmm. So I, I've often been frustrated that the city mm -hmm. doesn't officially endorse. Yeah, and in the past, mm -hmm. actually, lots of cities have actually broken up carpooling services, right? Uh, because because of regulatory rules, uh, yeah. uh, which which seems bizarre. But the the question, though, really. Um, so it at just the root is like, are there mechanisms or examples or m more examples of places so, so where people who are unlikely to look to the internet for a solution to their problem well, can be put like in touch? Well, it seems like there's like uh, conventional mm -hmm. solutions, mm -hmm. and then there are these shareable economy mm -hmm. solutions. And my question is whether you can think of other examples where these have kind of interlaced. Yeah, sure. And really, what we're looking at is, I think of it partly as the value chain and like who's connecting with whom in terms of information sharing, um, and also the role for partnerships. And so, for example, and I should also clarify, in the case of Good Gym, my assumption, it's not, it, when I talk about the partnership with NHS and the, the local boroughs, they're actually working with social services individuals who have more direct traditional forms of contacting, you know, calling a person on the phone to check in on them, say, do you need things, whatnot. Some of them are, are Wi-Fi, you know, digital savvy, but also looking at more traditional me mechanisms of initial communication. But what they're able to do is instead of having a staff of NHS people that need to go and provide all these services, and so forth, they're tapping into local members that can be part of that value chain. But actually, in fact, not just dig digital literacy, but having access to affordable internet and having some ability to engage in these platforms is a huge, think of it as just the gating factor. So there will always be a certain percentage of the population that is not able or not willing to opt into that. But we can get there by having, as I like to say, maybe not no meet intermediaries, but fewer intermediaries, and meeting people at the level um, of engagement that they're comfortable with. In terms of partnerships, just a couple of examples. So it's interesting. We. We are starting to see very small scale partnerships with governments, but this is where, as I mentioned, missing voice at the table. There is a world of opportunity there to rethink public services, to reimagine who's providing what in terms of certain aspects of public private partnerships. In the private sector, though, too, we do see companies, for example, GE, General Electric, partnered with <coughs> Corky, which is it's different than tech shop and so forth, but it's a collaborative production company where people are able to innovate and, and um, prototype products at a micro scale. So they've partnered together because Quirky could really use the resources and the infrastructure of GE. GE trying to innovate in that company as a whole is like turning a ship on a dime, right? So, so things like that um, have worked quite well. In the collaborative financing space, too, we see a lot of different partnerships where, if you think about crowdfunding, there's some component of the funding that's city capital, some component that's crowdfunded from the community, and then perhaps a private foundation that's kicking in a little bit more. So we see that kind of mixing as well. Um, but the city's piece, in particular, I think what we need to see is government saying we understand this space and we're going to get more involved. Then they begin to pilot, then the partnerships begin to form. We're still very early on, uh, and that's a nascent, nascent process. Great question. Thank you. Hi, that's a great talk. Um, my, uh, my background is, in, uh, is as a lawyer, and I guess the question I'm wondering, is there is there a possibility that the social and the collaborative economy will entrench existing inequities in society? So, and I mean, I mean, for instance, I mean, Toronto prides itself on being an incredibly multicultural city, as is Canada. But with as a multicultural city, there is sometimes conflict um, between different groups, and how would that play out? in this collaborative economy. So, so just um, to clarify the question a little bit, uh, in, in what way, be, you mean because some people can afford to hire other people to do things for them and then you I mean, dig, like I, I mean, dig in that dynamic or, or what uh, examples can you think of? Like where? Or, or seniors. Um, a lot of the collaborative economy is dependent on internet access, the ability to have access to a computer or some tech device that accesses the internet. Um, there's a lot of people in our communities and societies that don't have access to that. So, so for example, if I have a, uh, an iPhone that's always hooked up to a 3G network, uh, I can easily access all kinds of sharing stuff, and it's, it's very inexpensive for me. But if I don't have that phone, 
I, I'm cut off from that right. network is right or even the rural urban divide so mm -hmm. how do rural individuals access the collaborative economy because there needs to be a certain critical mass around different types of technology mm -hmm. or for instance when you I used to do work as a legal aid lawyer mm -hmm. if you're if you can't afford food how do you gain again how do you gain access mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. The Colorado economy. Mm -hmm. and I, I mean, it's, it's just like what these are just some challenges that I see, yeah. and I just would like your response. Well, to and one thing, and this is a slight side note, but you've hit on a real sweet spot for me. And what we're seeing now is the sharing economy begins to grow up, and people are saying, okay, this isn't just about a Silicon Valley entrepreneur. There's a huge emphasis right now on what this means for low income populations, and on one hand, studies of what are the demographics of people using this, because for the most part, it is still very much middle and upper class, but a lot of people that are tapping into these platforms to make ends meet. No question about that. And also at the same time, no question about how this boosts local economic investment wherever you are on the economic pyramid. But I think about the years I spent working on microfinance and marketplace creation at the base of the economic pyramid. Different setting, but the principles and the drivers were very much the same. So a couple of comments, because I, well, I thought you were, my, you were going ahead, and this is an added wrinkle, that one of the debates that is, you know, we don't, it's a hanging question mark. If you own assets, you can share them. But if you don't own assets, then how do you share them? But what I want to underscore here, and again, future, converse, future talk, um, we're looking at wherever you sit on the economic pyramid, the most compelling argument I can make economically is that sharing rather than owning assets saves you money. So even if you are a low income individual and you can tap into some shared assets, that means you have more money to spend on other things, however much money you have. Now that doesn't erase the problem of you know, the wealth pyramid, but it's, it enables you to save a little bit more to, to, to get you know, to, to run your household budget a little bit more efficiently. Uh, and by and large, we, are, we know that these structures are more inclusive. We know that in some, especially markets, just using the case of Airbnb, <coughs> markets where access to low-income housing is hard and there's a finite amount of land, it can be very hard to chat. Like San Francisco and New York, they're seeing some really big challenges. But where there's, where there's slack supply, it's just, it's, a, it's free range, and it's, it's only a good thing to include more people wherever they are coming from. Yeah. Okay. I mean, that's, that's what I was um, just thinking on that subject of, uh, I mean, public libraries are an old example of mm -hmm. the sharing economy, right? And it charges a fee from all of us collectively. We have the, the largest public library system in the world by, per capita in Toronto, mm -hmm. right? Um, but. But so, so there's a socialized version of the sharing economy, and it seems what's what's really uh, disruptive and innovative and new about this is that it sort of like becomes individualized, so that every person can run or patronize their own version of the public library. Right? There's this whole thing around. Um, I mentioned the the difference between personal and commercial use, and there's this new theme or phrase, people as business. So we know how to regulate individuals, regulate. We know how to regulate businesses, but how do you regulate a person that is kind of a business? But real quick, I just want to go back to what you talked about, public libraries. So I feel like the public library is one of the, the most interesting, unique, original, powerful sharing platforms we know about. And I believe that we're going to see a resurgence in, in the context of shareable cities, a resurgence of public libraries, but not just as places to share books. Mm -hmm. Places, think about these more as co-working spaces, places where you can access all kinds of goods the and Toronto services The public library so just unveiled its 3D printer that's available for there you public go. use. So. Tech shop. Yeah. As well as, but think about all that a library could be. It's a tool library and much more. I see a bunch of people lined mm -hmm. up there, but we're actually just about a, a, out of time, and I've been told we should take a, one more question, okay. uh, and then I, I hope we'll be able to chat or, mm -hmm. or you know, carry this conversation out into the world where uh, where the questions and answers will happen on a peer-to-peer -peer basis as much as anything. So, uh, okay. hi, April. Um, I'd like to get my community, which is not uh, Toronto, it's Burlington, uh, to be a shareable city. I've got a good mayor. Uh, maybe the folks in this room would like Rob Ford to share a bit more, but uh, how, do you, how do you get started? And second, how do you prevent a council, because politicians are great at proclaiming all kinds of things and saying, we are now a shareable city. 
what, at what tipping point does that truly become? So where do you start and how do you know you've got there? Yeah. Great question. Boy, you just gave me that lovely softball because this is what I do. This is like my mission. Um, and on one hand, I can say there's no one straight way that you do this. Um, you first want to identify who the people are that you would like to be part of this process. And then it really is about figuring out on day one what do you need to do next? In a lot of cases, the first thing you need to do is build awareness and capacity and education within the government itself to help then set a strategy and a vision. And as a side note, I mean, at Collaborative Lab, this is what we do. And we guide and, and hold the hands, if you will, of local governments and can say that a lot of this, usually the first need is to actually give us access to this information so maybe it's something like forming a, you know, having a workshop or something like that. But then in terms of what cities, what we've seen cities around the world do, forming task forces or working groups, which again begin as ways to learn and unpack which kinds of platforms most resonate with the needs of our citizens. Do we think, are we sitting on assets that are slack that we could easily put into shared use? Um, have we signed up to another mandate, for example, around climate change or jobs creation or local economic investment where we can tie a new goal around the collaborative economy to something we've already signed up to do? So what we find is that there are so many different angles around entrepreneurship, local economic investment, you name it. It's more like you do a, an assessment, a snapshot of the city's health and then <coughs> Ultimately, if the goal is to build a, an integrated full urban planning strategy around this, that takes time. But figure out what's that one vertical or that one champion or that one policy that you start with and then use that as sort of the first layer of the onion that you start to peel back. I can also mention um, shareablecity.com is a a platform that we run for cities to learn more. And there are some materials available, um, I can say, I'm not sure if they're around here, where we have the top 10 things to do to become shareable, just on your own. Uh, a guide to where, what other cities are doing around the world. And I'm happy to send that to you if there's not access to it here at the venue. And I, I would just add, as somebody who uh, writes about local politics for a living, that you, if, if you uh, are hoping that Burlington Council and the Burlington Mayor will embrace it, then taking something like shareablecity.com and um, so, some of the information that we've learned here today and finding a champion within the city mm -hmm. council or somebody in the mayor's office, especially there's an opportunity for a city like Burlington, uh, perhaps in the shadow of um, Rob Ford or whatever, mm -hmm. uh, if they get the idea that they can become the first Canadian city to join up to this yeah. powerful network. Uh, but if you find a political champion to, to put those ideas right in their ear, then, then it, it can actually happen a lot quicker that way. So. And one final note, and, and then the, the, the Uber, not Uber cars, but Uber meta goal around the shareable cities concept is to connect those cities that are shareable to one another. Because as we think about it, it's early on building the critical mass and getting access to information, the, the transaction costs are so high. But as more cities enter this space, so for Burlington to then figure out a little bit what it wants to do and then connect with other cities elsewhere where it's much easier for it to tap in and learn from those best practices around what worked and what didn't and so forth. And the point I wanted to make is there are opportunities for small, medium, and large cities here. And I love to underscore the fact that cities Big cities are great for urban density and access to a lot of more people, more things to share. So there's kind of no question on that piece. But a lot of times it's around, what do we do in a small town? And what I like to show too is that there are certain advantages that small towns have. It's not as though you're going to have access to everything else everyone else has. But if you're in a town with one stoplight, I would argue that you're probably already more shareable <laughs> because you know more people in the community <laughs> and we're not talking about having a fancy app and all the rest, but that in fact, there are certain advantages to small cities around the shareability concept that big cities have to think about how do we take this to scale. Mm -hmm. Small towns have a much more just ingrained way of, of thinking about this. A little barn raising culture. A little bit. Thank you, April. Thank you. And um, uh, before I hand it over to you, I want to thank uh, SIG and Mars and uh, Cities for People for, uh, for having me and, and uh, 
and making me part of such an interesting thing. And, um, and I'd like to thank all of you on behalf of us for coming. You're probably about to say the same thing. So well, actually, uh, before you leave, we actually have one more speaker. So I, oh, we uh, do? Before okay. people go, okay, so very briefly, can, uh, and speaking of cities for people. So okay. thank you, both of you. Uh, we also have, we have Vanessa Timmert with us. Yes. Thank you. That was great. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Edward and April, uh, for a great conversation. And I really wish we had more time for questions. We did start a little bit late, so we're just pushing a little past our our finish time. Uh, speaking of cities for people, we talked about that. You know, this tour uh, is uh, marks the launch of Cities for People. We thought you might like to hear a little bit more about that. So we have Vanessa Timmer here, who's uh, executive director of Vancouver-based One Earth, and she's going to talk to us about that. Great, so, thanks, Charles. Thank So I have like an hour presentation. If we could just, I'm kidding, no I don't. <laughs> um, no, actually I just wanted to pick up what April said at the end there, that the reason I'm going from uh, Montreal to Toronto to Calgary to Vancouver with April is that Cities for People is really an experiment in connecting the dots. So what she said at the end where it helps sometimes to bridge across domains, to look at local and national projects and how they might become more than the sum of their parts. We're doing that in a kind of distributed networking way and so one Earth, my nonprofit is one of a series of a group of four facilitators. Evergreen City Works, that was also co sponsored tonight, is focused on the built and natural environment. Muzagetti's in Guelph is focused on the role of art and culture in the building of cities. And Montreal's Urban Ecology Center is focused on civic engagement and governance. And One Earth, we're focused on new economies. So, this is why we're so excited about what's happening in the sharing economy space. We're just this is our initial event, so if you go to citiesforpeople.ca, you can sign up as we're going to be putting out the uh, the website really soon. But the most important thing is we we think that really we can raise the bar in terms of what our cities can be, and we can place well-being really of people, of our planet, of prosperity right at the heart of what cities could be. So I know many of you are here because you join in that vision, and I encourage you to connect with us so that we can continue this conversation of how to make Canada shareable. And I just want to thank um, Mars and Social Innovation Generation and the hosts of, the of this tour across Canada, and what a pleasure to be here in this room with so many people also as excited about what's happening in this space. So thank you so much. Have a great evening and let's continue sharing and building these cities. Take care. Thank you, Vanessa. Uh, just again, a really big thank you to April Rennie for tonight for the great talk and for Edward for the great conversation we had afterwards. April, thank you. Uh, if you want to... Uh, if you want to continue to follow the conversation on this, uh, you can follow Mars on Twitter. We're going to be following April across Canada. And SIG as well uh, will be following the tour. And obviously April Rini on uh, Twitter, Twitter, it's at April Rini, so you can follow uh, what's, what's going on for her. So again, thank you everyone tonight for coming out. And uh, stay tuned for the next Global, Global Leadership Series, which I believe is in April. And uh, we'll, we'll tweet out about that at that time. So thank you all for coming. <laughs>